morning and good afternoon, depending on where you are joining us from. I'm honored to welcome you all to the McQuaigie Foundation's final expert session on our conference on the international treaty making process. First, a couple housekeeping notes. One, the session, as you will have noted, is being recorded. And two, the chat function is open. If anyone in the audience is having technical difficulties, please let our team know in the chat. If you have questions, please add them to the chat and we will see at the end of the discussion if we have time to answer a few. Before handing over to our expert panel, I'm going to give a short introduction for any new guests to explain why the McQuaigie Foundation has organized this conference. Following Dr. McQuaigie's call for action and the need for robust international response at last year's G7 annual summit, the McQuaigie Foundation launched the Red Line Initiative. The Red Line Initiative is rooted in the belief that sexual violence and conflict and as a method of warfare represents a violation of our shared humanity that can no longer be accepted as an unfortunate but unpreventable part of armed conflict. Despite its de devastating impact, early warning and prevention efforts remain fragmented, states are not held responsible for violations, and survivors are too often left without assistance and reparation in the aftermath. The Red Line Initiative seeks to address these systemic deficiencies through the creation of an international instrument that draws a red line against the use of sexual violence and conflict, including as a method of warfare. It is with this in mind that we have organized with the financial support of the United Kingdom's government of CDO office, this expert conference. Last Wednesday, we held the first session with Dr or with Professor Charles Jallo and Akila Radhikrishnan, who shared with us in a very informative and thought-provoking discussion, an overview of the United Nations treaty development process with a particular focus on the role of the International Law Commission. Earlier today, we heard from Dr. Priya Pillay, Lauren Ahrens, Arsalan Suleiman, in a conversation moderated with Kristen Broker, that looked at the various existing treaty frameworks, and we heard a very informative discussion about the enforcement mechanisms that currently exist under international law. In this final session, we are really pleased to welcome our distinguished panelists who will share with us important lessons learned from recent and ongoing campaigns to establish new international treaties. Let me briefly introduce our distinguished guests. Dr. Matthew Preston has been a research analyst in the multilateral research group at the FCDO since 2003. In this role, he has provided research analysis and policy advice on a wide range of global themes and in international organizations, particularly the United Nations. This has ranged from the UN Security Council and the General Assembly to various parts of the wider UN system. He has also negotiated for the United Kingdom at eight sessions of the General Assembly and a similar number of sessions of the Human Rights Council and its predecessor, the Commission on Human Rights. Dr. Preston, we are very pleased that you're here to moderate this panel. Next, we have Susanna Serkin. Susanna is the former director of policy and a senior advisor at Physicians for Human Rights, where she worked from 1987 to, to this past year helping to launch the organization and lead its many investigations and advocacy initiatives for almost four decades. Her work at Physicians for Human Rights over the years has included overseeing the documentation of genocide and systemic rape, coordinating exhumations of mass graves, and the documentation of the use of chemical weapons. Today, Susanna serves as a member of the steering committee for the Safeguarding Health and Conflict Coalition. Finally, we're very pleased to have Layla Sadat with us. Layla is the James Carr Professor of International Criminal Law and longtime director of the Whitney R. Harris World Law Institute at Washington University School of Law. She also serves as special advisor in Crimes Against Humanity to the International Criminal Court Prosecutor and formerly served as a member of the US Commission on International Religious Freedom. Layla is one of the world's foremost authorities in the field of public international law, international criminal law, 
human rights, and foreign affairs. She was the first woman selected to host, to hold the Alexis de Tocqueville Distinguished Fulbright Chair in Paris, France. Dr. Sadat, Professor Sadat directs the Crimes Against Humanity Initiative, a groundbreaking project launched in 2008 to write the world's first global treaty on crimes against humanity. It is my profound pleasure to welcome all of you to this discussion. And finally, I do want to stress that our panelists are participating in their personal capacity. I will now stop to allow all of us to benefit from the panelists' extensive knowledge and expertise. Dr. Preston, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Erin. Uh, really looking forward to, to today's session this afternoon in my time and uh, this morning for many of your time. Um, treaty making is, uh, is such a wide field. There are so many different uh, uh, dimensions to treaty making. Um, obviously, uh, in the substance that treaties address, uh, the processes that are used to, to negotiate and adopt them, uh, different actors involved in treaties, and of course, different politics, um, according to the issue in the forum. Um, speaking as a representative of the UK, I've spent uh, some of my life advocating for treaties and supporting treaty making processes that the UK was in favour of, in favour of, and I spent just as much time, if not more, um, supporting the UK opposition to certain treaties. Uh, because that's the name of the political game in, in, in the International Forum and what we're look, going to engage with as, as we progress with this treaty. Um, so it's a great pleasure to have a uh, panel with us. And um, I'd like to start with Leila, if I may, and, and then we'll move, move over to Susanna. Um, could you tell us a little about the, the issue you were working on um, and your role in the campaign for a treaty? Thank you so much, Matthew, and thank you so much to the McQuaggy Foundation and the Red Line Initiative for the opportunity to, to participate and, and uh, at the very sort of ground floor of this exciting uh, new possibility. So I'm, I'm a professor of international law at Washington University, and I had the pleasure and opportunity to participate in the negotiation of the International Criminal Court Statute in 1998. I came on board uh, even before that, and I had firsthand experience, if you like, of seeing uh, how a treaty like that that was so important got negotiated and what some of the issues were. And the thing that had happened that really sparked my interest in a new convention on crimes against humanity, which is the treaty initiative that I lead, is when the decision of Bosnia versus Serbia came out many years after the ICC treaty was negotiated, um, the judgment of the International Court of Justice in that case was limited to questions under the genocide convention. And it was clear that crimes against humanity had been committed, but the court couldn't reach them because there was no global treaty on crimes against humanity. And that made me recollect an article that one of my mentors, Sharif Basuni, had written right around the time that the Rome statute was getting up and running, which was, why don't we have a specialized convention on crimes against humanity? And so I reached out to Sharif Basuni, who had been the chair of the drafting committee at Rome for the ICC statute, to Richard Goldstone, who, of course, was well known in the field and, and a dear friend and mentor of mine as well, and to a handful of others and said, what about the possibility of finally, now that we have the Rome Statute, we have a carefully negotiated definition of crimes against humanity, why don't we try to complete the Rome Statute system by developing a new convention on crimes against humanity? And so I created something under the auspices of the Whitney Harris World Law Institute at my university. My background is here I am at Washington University in St. Louis. And, uh, and, and, and we started. And so we started actually uh, commissioning papers on the subject, trying to establish if there was a legal gap, what would the nature of that gap look like. We had uh, several experts contribute papers to an initial working group session, and Professor Vassiuni at the time began the process of uh, drafting. What could a Crimes Against Humanity Convention look like? What, what, might it, um, what might the provisions be? And so that was a very first, very historic meeting that we had in St. Louis, Missouri in April of 2009. Whitney Harris was still alive. And that was very exciting because he was the last living member of Justice Jackson's team at Nuremberg. And so we had kind of this direct connection to the lineage, if you like, of, of Nuremberg. 
And uh, even though there was some definite skepticism, and I can talk about that maybe later in the project, I think one of the things that has allowed the project to be as successful as it is, because now here we are on the doorsteps of the UN General Assembly actually taking action on a proposed um, new treaty and opening up a diplomatic conference, we hope in the near future, is that it was a process that started small with a lot of really great experts who were very, very knowledgeable and had pre-existing experience in treaty drafting and sort of taking this. And uh, we didn't hesitate to think big, but also check our own intuitions by having lots of experts come in and, you know, take pot shots at the project. And so it was a very inclusive process uh, that sort of started with a small circle and expanded out. I, I can come back to it later, but essentially after the first meeting in St. Louis, we did a little more drafting and then took the project to The Hague, where we had a much bigger expert meeting where we could include people actually working at the ICTR, ICTY, uh, Appeals Chamber, all, all the people at the ICC, lots of international justice practitioners and colleagues and scholars from Europe, as well as some NGOs. And, and one of the things I should add is, and, and I'll finish with this because then we can talk a little bit more as uh, I know Susanna wants to chime in as well. But one of the things that I think was important was I had participated in the Princeton Principles on Universal Jurisdiction. I was a commissioned expert in that uh, project. And the non-governmental organizations were excluded from all participation in that project. And that was upsetting to them. And I think it actually was not a good result because it was then a purely academic project that didn't have input from civil society. And so we didn't see ourselves as a purely civil society movement. There were people that had deep connections to states in our group of experts, but we also thought it was important at the outset to include include voices from civil society. So especially in the Hague meeting, Chris Hall came from Amnesty, uh, Bill Pace came from the CICC. We had lots of civil society participation as well as academics and some uh, government leaders as well as international criminal justice experts and persons. And so I do think having an inclusive process that sort of looked at the various stakeholders was important, especially for a treaty that this was a big idea after 70 years completing this gap in the Nuremberg structure, because many people thought the ICC did the job. And so we had to actually explain to them, no, the ICC is a vertical mechanism. We still don't have the horizontal mechanism. And that turned out to be difficult. <laughs> so I think I'll stop there and let Susanna chime in. Thank you so much, Leila. Susanna, over to you. Well, thank you so much, um, Matt. It's an honor to be here with you and Leila. And thank you to the McQuaggy Foundation for these initiatives, uh, the Red Line Initiative and all the work that, that's being done um, to try to uh, stop and prevent and hold people accountable for um, the, the horrific um, incidents of, of sexual violence and conflict. Um, what I'm here to talk about today is pr probably the most extraordinary effort that I have been privileged to participate in in the course of many decades of working in, in human rights and, and in um, international uh, law issues. And that is the um, problem of anti-personnel landmines and the historic and um, really groundbreaking um, work, uh, so to speak, of the international campaign to ban landmines. And uh, Physicians for Human Rights, where I worked at the beginning of, of this campaign, uh, was one of the six original organizations, non-governmental organizations that launched the campaign. And that's, that was back in 1991, 1992. At the beginning, we were not thinking about a new treaty at all. We were just trying to ban this weapon. And I'll just mention the problem a little bit so that to put in context, everything else I'm gonna talk about later on. And that is that um, back in 1991, there were estimated to be as many as 100 million anti-personnel landmines uh, buried just a few inches from the surface of the ground on almost every continent. There were even people who were still being um, expl exploding landmines by stepping on them, civilians in Belgium, landmines dating back to World War I which is very shocking. But more importantly, there were when a, the precipitating event in, in effect, in my view, or at least my experience, was the fact that uh, following peace negotiations between Cambodia and Vietnam, there were 
tens of thousands of uh, longstanding refugees from Cambodia who had been in camps on the Thai-Cambodian border who were poised to be returned to Cambodia. And Physicians for Human Rights, together with Asia Watch, which was eventually uh, merged with other watch groups to form Human Rights Watch, uh, decided to send a team to look at the problem of landmines, anti-personnel landmines in Cambodia. And the result of that was this uh, really landmark report, uh, Landmines in Cambodia, which was the subtitle uh, was The Coward's War. And the report, uh, following an investigation of uh, an incredible orthopedic surgeon uh, and who also happened to have a master's in public health, uh, Dr. James Kobe, as well as Eric Stovers, one of the main authors of the report, uh, was at the time uh, working both with PHR and with Human Rights Watch. They uh, came up with the, the statistic that one out of every 231 Cambodians was a landmine amputee. And they were able to describe in great detail the extent of the problem, how the injuries were extraordinarily egregious, how one out of every two people who stepped on a mine, and they were mostly civilians, women and children, farmers, died. And the others most likely had one or more limbs amputated if they managed to reach a hospital for care. And that the long lasting problems um, really resulted in a huge drain on the medical and public health system, lack of livelihoods for so many people who are disabled, uh, as well as uh, literally preventing hundreds and thousands of acres of land from being arable. And so there were economic consequences as well as humanitarian ones. So we called for a ban. The six organizations got together, uh, the Vietnam Veterans of America Foundation, Medico International, Handicap um, International, uh, and the Landmines Advisory, the Mines Advisory Group, which were D-miners, uh, Human Rights Watch and, and Physicians for Human Rights. And we said, you know, this weapon just should not exist. It should be banned. And um, the only forum for discussions around limiting the use of this very widely and very cheap weapon, uh, which was being produced and continued to be exported and used uh, in, in dozens of situations, the only solution was for it to be banned, and the only location for discussion was the Conference on D Disarmament, the United Nations, which was a very, uh, we called it, uh, a really slow, uh, cumbersome uh, gl move, process that moved at a glacial pace, and that was certainly not going to completely ban the weapon. So we formed a campaign, and long story short, and we'll talk about this soon, I hope, um, miraculously, uh, in five short years, a treaty was negotiated outside the traditional United Nations process led by the government of Canada and other governments. Um, and it was the most widely supported and fastest moving or negotiated uh, arms control treaty uh, to this day ever in history. Um, and there was a signing of the treaty in Ottawa in 1997, so only five years after the campaign got organized, and 122 nations signed the treaty at the time. Uh, a mere two years later, uh, the 40th ratification of the treaty, which was required for the treaty to enter into force, was achieved, and currently there are 164 states parties to the treaty. Um, I can talk more about the uniqueness of the treaty, but I will uh, end this piece by saying that the role of non-governmental organizations was truly precedent setting. It drove the treaty forward. It, uh, we worked at multiple levels with a massive campaign by the end of five years. There were more than 1,500 non-governmental organizations in the campaign. It started with six. Uh, in five years, there were 1,500 on, on every continent. And the, the techniques we used, um, which I participated in throughout the the five years as I was one of the lead representatives of Physicians for Human Rights in the, in the whole process. Although I'm not a lawyer, I did not negotiate the treaty. I was not behind those closed doors, but I was certainly aware of most steps of the process. There are probably some that we'll never know about that did happen behind closed doors. 
Um, but the interaction between non-governmental organizations is represented by the campaign and, and all of its many members uh, were truly groundbreaking and, and really shattered many norms. A question that we have is how replicable is this and what has happened in the decades since then that may facilitate um, such an effort or may hamper such an effort. But thank you. Thank you so much for that, Susanna. That's fascinating from both of you. Um, uh, it's really, I mean, it's fascinating for me, obviously, as, as a diplomat, listening to two, uh, two experts uh, from a non-governmental field, for, uh, experts and uh, activists and scholarly fields, because we all, we all play these different roles in the treaty process. And two of the things that strike me in particular from both of your, uh, your opening words there were that um, I think in each case, we, we, we've got issues where, where the, the issues had long been salient, but in some ways there were blockages um, to making progress. Um, and uh, it really brings home to me that, you know, outside of our diplomatic silo, there are so often so many people working on these issues um, outside of the formal intergovernmental fora, whether they're, whether they're activists, scholars, practitioners and, and all combinations of, of, of the above. Um, but Susanna, if I could pick you up a little bit there on the process and maybe we can start off with you and then move to Leila. I mean, how, how did you seek to influence the process, a process that in the, in the Conference of Disarmament to be blocked for so long? So how did you seek to influence it and, and, and how did you go about that? Well, I, I will say that the, um, the campaign really worked in parallel with the work of governments, but also pushed governments at every step. And uh, initially, the campaigners, there was sort of a legal subcommittee. So the campaign organized, we had a, a first formation conference, uh, one in Paris and then one in the UK. There were some early funders, and it organized itself as a true coalition. And early on, we we created sort of subcommittees, and they they logically revolved around the legal framework, for how to achieve a ban, which initially focused on the Conference on Disarmament, but also others, media campaigners, humanitarian campaigners, the survivors themselves, who we brought to the fore and so forth, and we can talk about that later. But in terms of the treaty itself, the effort was to, um, to achieve the strongest possible um, prohibition of the production and sale transfinitional issues that the campaign was pushing early on. Can you hear me? My, I'm getting a message. My internet is unstable. You can hear me? I'm okay. Okay, good. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, there were some governments that wanted to distinguish between so-called smart minds, which could self-destruct or self-detonate after a certain period of time, and what came to be known as dumb minds, and the campaign pushed very hard to prevent uh, that um, distinction uh, from being used to water down the, uh, any negotiation. Uh, we continued to push governments to unilaterally support a ban outside of the CD process very early on. And so uh, among the more significant things that happened as a result of the campaigning effort, which uh, throughout revolve, involved putting out um, really hard hitting and um, very deeply factual uh, reports documenting the incidents, documenting injuries, documenting deaths, but also telling a very human story of landmines. At every step of the conference, the campaigners would be outside the rooms, getting media stories, pushing, driving it, but inside in the corridors, of the conferences, there were the legal. There was the legal team of the campaign, and and that included, you know, deep experts. And I think one of the strategies of the campaign was to become more expert than the treaty negotiators. And so, time and time again, as I recall, the campaign was contacted by governments and by the negotiators to provide them information uh, to use in the negotiations, because we had the leading demining organizations. We had the, the doctors who treated. Early on, I will say, very, this is very consequential, was the International Committee of the Red Cross also supported a call for the ban. Uh, 
And as you know, the ICRC is very careful in how it acts and what it says and when and where it says what it says. Uh, and also is very actively not saying certain things. Um, but jumping in was, was a huge win early on. But um, what happened in terms of the move fairly early on to sort of sideline the conference on disarmament, if you will, was that individual governments took initiatives. And even President Clinton in 1994 at the UN General Assembly called for a ban. He later walked it back and that was very disappointing. But um, the government of Belgium uh, was the first government to actually unilaterally ban mines. And that set, uh, set a process in motion where other governments started to make similar statements. And early on, that sort of moved, a, uh, and, and if you will, fast-tracked a different process that in a few years resulted in, the, in Canada um, actually calling for a treaty that would be negotiated completely outside the Conference on Disarmament. And, you know, I, I remember being in our office in Boston at the time when we got a call um, from the from the, the meeting uh, of, the, of the conference on disarmament where uh, Lloyd Axworthy, the, the former um, foreign minister of Canada, uh, who really was a, a true hero in all of this, uh, said, you know, forget about this. We're going to meet in Ottawa in a year and we're going we're to have a treaty negotiated and we're going to do it outside this this sort of glacial process. Um, and I, I just remember everybody all over the world in the campaign just erupted in cheers and people started calling each other. And it was this momentous surprise, really, because I don't think it, it wasn't it wasn't planned in five years, step by step in this way. Um, I'll, I guess I'll stop there. That's there's more to say about actually how the treaty, once it became that treaty was negotiated and we can talk about that later and how the campaign influenced the actual language of the treaty. Oh, and thank you. I, I very much look forward to that. Leila, process in terms of the Crimes Against Humanity Convention. I mean, what, what do you think is, is important for us to understand? Well, I think that the difference between a treaty on something like crimes against humanity and the landmines ban is it's not a single issue treaty. That made it much more complicated. I think that we tried to do the same thing that Susanna is talking about, which is first establish the sociological case. What's the material need, right? What's the sociological reality? What's the material need? Um, what's happening that gives rise to a practical need for this treaty? And so we definitely evoked that, whether it was sexual violence, actually, which is uh, a question, I think, for, for, for this effort, which is crimes against humanity applies in wartime and in peacetime. It would be the first multilateral convention addressing sexual violence, basically, because of the provisions on rape and, and sexual violence in crimes against humanity under Article 7 of the Rome Statute which comes over. But you have lots of other things as well. You have enforced disappearances, you have torture, you have murder, extermination, enslavement, lots and lots of provisions of, um, of crimes against humanity are not covered by a different treaty. So we have a whole list of very, very horrendous crimes and making the case for these are ongoing because many people sort of thought, well, we created the International Criminal Court. We don't have the problem anymore, right? That's what we did the ICC for is they have crimes against humanity in their statute. So why would we need a new treaty that does this? And so it became surprisingly complex to advocate for a treaty given the already existing International Criminal Court statute, even when you would point out that, but the ICC only takes a handful of cases. The ICC has limited jurisdiction. Not every state's a party to the treaty. Um, it was still a much more complex endeavor, I think, than what Susanna is talking about, where you can literally go out and see millions of landmines. You know they're a horrible thing. You have the teams of doctors and advocates saying, stop, 
you know, this, this human and, and, and agricultural carnage. And it, it's sort of a much easier case, whereas ours was a complex case involving often, and this is the other thing, involving massive state violence in some cases. So what's the, the paradigmatic when you look at the, the examples that we chose in our film, because one of the things we did to try to make the case, first I had a PowerPoint and I went to states after we finished our drafting and our drafting, we have a book too. I don't know if you can see it, but it's called Forging a Convention for Crimes Against Humanity. And um, I'm happy to send a copy to anybody. So we commissioned the papers, we drafted the treaty, we wrote about the need. Uh, and then we had to start, in a sense, our advocacy campaign. So ours was reversed, Susanna. We actually were sort of the the thinkers that came up with the legal method, and then we had to go and sell the the uh, the need. And so we did a PowerPoint, but the problem with the PowerPoint is I had to run around with a PowerPoint and there's only one of me. And we started going to the Assembly of States parties for the ICC, which is the natural sort of parallel organization, because those are already states that have accepted the Rome statute. And so since we'd taken the Rome statute definition, it was logical for them to say, yeah, this is a great idea. Idea. And in fact, there was a huge amount of concern. What if this hurts the ICC statute? What if it actually siphons ratifications away from the Rome statute? That is, there are states that say, oh, we'll just ratify crimes against humanity and not bring ourselves into the ICC. So I think the political landscape was much more fraught um, because if you look at going back to my film, so we needed a film because the PowerPoint required me to run around with it. And so we looked at cases that were emblematic of the crimes and emblematic of the potential universe of criminal actors. So some of the crimes are crimes of sexual violence. We use the DRC actually for that because it had been adjudicated, it had been acknowledged that this was a case in which rape was a weapon of war. And so that I think was very salient. For state crimes in peacetime, the example we picked was North Korea because the detention camps in North Korea had been called a situs of crimes against humanity by an international commission of inquiry. And it seemed beyond the pale. But once you start alleging that states might be responsible for the commission of crimes against humanity, you can envisage the political res resistance that you're gonna have to your treaty. Um, Non-state actors, there is still a fight in the international community, not a, a vigorous fight, but some contending you had to have state action, that non-state actors were not um, capable of committing crimes against humanity. And the counter example that we used was ISIS. I think if you didn't have a treaty that covered cases like the ISIS case and the attacks on the Yazidi and the attacks on villages uh, by members of ISIS, um, you wouldn't have a very effective treaty because you'd have a huge gap in the law. And so we picked, uh, and then you had disappearances in Latin America. We tried to show that on every single continent in the world, there were literally millions of victims of crimes against humanity. And you can easily document that, but somehow I think it was much more difficult than what Sauzana is talking about because it was such a complex, multi-faceted issue. We were very fortunate, and I'll, I'll end with this, in that one of the conferences that we held, we held one, as I said, in St. Louis, then we went to The Hague, and then our capstone conference was in Washington, D.C. at the Brookings Institution. And I had invited all the law professors teaching on related subjects um, in the D.C. area to come to our conference, just to hear about this idea, right, which was still considered a little radical. And uh, a, a professor at George Washington University, Sean Murphy, came to our conference, and it turned out that that was serendipitous divine intervention because he later was elected to the UN International Law Commission and decided to make a development of a Crimes Against Humanity Convention sort of his signature initiative at the ILC. And so that again, I think speaks to, it, it's a testimony to the need for inclusive participation because honestly, you never know where your friends and supporters might come from unless you invite people to the party and you're willing to um, hear their either criticisms or, or their positive uh, feedback. And so once we moved into the realm of the International Law Commission, we started the laborious process of, of of sort of advocating in front of the ILC. 
uh, in, in terms of the things that were in our original draft convention and not letting go of some of those good ideas as the process drew a little closer to states. What we never got, um, uh, contrary to Canada's espousal of the landmines ban early, is we never got a small group of states willing to put their sort of credibility on the line and say, we're gonna be the standard bearers for this treaty. That did happen, but it happened much later. It happened well over a decade after we started the project where Austria has now publicly said, we will host a diplomatic conference for this treaty. Germany has been a huge advocate. Many Latin American states and African states have really stepped up to the plate. But we didn't have that sort of singular moment that Susanna's talking about, I think in part because it's a more complicated treaty. And to be honest, it's a much more complicated world right now. We are not in the 1990s, which was the decade of international law. We are in the age of the strongman with uh, an ongoing conflict uh, in Europe again which could provide new impetus for this treaty. But uh, the 2000s, after the war on terror, there was a degradation uh, in some ways of international lawmaking. And so the kind of coalition that I think you were easily able to assemble in the 1990s was much, much more difficult in, in 2000. And we've just had to be patient and recognize that's a political reality of uh, a much more complex treaty, a much more complex process, and a much more complex world. Thank you so much for that. And I think these are themes we're going to return to in, in, in the rest of our session now. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm really struck by the way you, you, your description of, you know, the, the role, I would say, this role of states in the process and other political actors. Um, I mean, by definition, I'm, I'm not an international lawyer, either. I'm not a lawyer at all, um, but by definition, treaty making involves states in, to some degree. Um, and yet so often states are culpable for the, for the issues that you're looking at, whether for manufacturing landmines, for committing crimes against humanity, for so whether by acts of commission, whether by acts of omission, by failing to regulate uh, the behavior of non-state actors, and sometimes even if states aren't responsible for the things that you're trying to prohibit, um, they may have ancillary concerns, which both of you have alluded to, that may, uh, that may stand in the way of, uh, of them supporting a treaty. Um, uh, so I wonder if you could, if you could each, and again, we'll, we'll turn it back to you later to begin with, uh, talk a little bit about how you went about then trying to influence these political actors, including states in the process. And if, if you don't mind me throwing you a curveball on this one, I'm particularly interested as part of that in the role of the Global South here, because I, th I find it really striking how often, I mean, it's not exclusive at all, of course not, but how often the names of the individuals, the groups, the NGOs, the states that we talk about in these treaty making processes are the, those from the glo Global North to some description. Um, and yet, obviously, if you're trying to do something in a global forum, the global north is in a minority. So how does one go about influencing the, the world as a whole? So one of the um, let me take the the second part of your question first, because we recognize that right away. And what we had hoped to do was have regional meetings all around the world. So we had definitely um, had. Our first meetings were basically in the WIOG area in a way because it's who we knew and it's what we could afford. <laughs> you know, there's there's money. If you're a, if you're an NGO, the 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 spigot of money is not um, infinite. And uh, the other thing we did is we translated our project into French very very early, which actually reaches a huge swath of Francophone Africa. Um, we had it translated it into Arabic into Chinese, into all, all the UN um, Spanish. And then I had a colleague from Germany who loved the project, who himself had it translated into German. And then another colleague had it translated into Portuguese. And that sounds like a small thing, but it's actually huge. So, uh, you know, Showing that you are not just gonna work in English, work uh, even in English and French, but actually make this text available to people in all six United Nations languages plus two now, I think was a huge part of our effort for outreach 
And we were lucky enough to find individuals either willing to do it for free or very low cost. Uh, the Arabic translation is unofficial because Sharif Basuni didn't like necessarily the exact text of the Arabic. And what we also discovered, Matthew, which is really interesting, is that the um, translations even of UN documents in other, the uh, French, English, Spanish, very consistent across documents. You get to the other three languages, sometimes it's a bit of a mess. And that is a very interesting thing that we found when trying to say, well, we pulled this piece right out of the torture convention and then you'd go look at the different translations. So, you know, working across languages are very important and we wanted to have regional meetings. So we did that for Latin America. We had a Latin American regional meeting. We had an Asia Pacific regional meeting. I went to South Africa. We never were able to find, the African Union was in a very tendentious relationship with the ICC at the time um, because that was during the the time of the al-Bashir indictment and a lot of pushback against global justice. And so what we had was sort of more one-off meetings. Um, two members of my steering committee were actually African, Richard Goldstone from South Africa and Basuni, who was American, but also Egyptian. So we really did have that outreach. Um, I would love now that the treaty is getting more traction in the United Nations to do more work in terms of global outreach. And there it's going to take global civil society organizations, including African NGOs and Asian NGOs, which are really the groups that we haven't, can, you, you see that in the state participation. We have about 86 states and entities deeply uh, engaged in this, 76 of whom are positive, so that's fantastic. And we're seeing that the African Union is coming along, but you still don't have broad, widespread, I think because of this tendentious relationship that Africa has had with the ICC. And I say Africa because that's not necessarily African civil society or all states, but the African Union position has been uh, tendentious with the International Criminal Court. It was for, for many years. I think that's abating now. So, um, so we really have tried. It's a big job. It would be great to have in our area a very broad coalition of states. And I think that's starting to appear. So in the last uh, six committee discussions that I followed, South Africa, Nigeria, Peru, Costa Rica, Myanmar, Haiti, uh, many, many states from the global south and from the least developed world or for Asia Pacific, not necessarily the global south, but just a region that mm. hasn't been as participatory in human rights treaties or um, even with the ICC statute, we're starting to see a lot more uh, participation and excitement about this convention. We also are seeing a couple of permanent members of the Security Council not so excited about this treaty, and so that has been uh, definitely um, definitely a blockage. And uh, as I said, and I think Susanna's example is fantastic, they had a true campaign. We're just at the point now of developing sort of that campaign. And in a way, it's because it's been a different treaty. It's been, it didn't come from the medical sociological reality into the treaty making process. We started, sort of started with the, the treaty making process. And when we started, we thought it would actually be easier Although Sharif did warn me, he said the hard part of the treaty is going to be selling it to states. You know what you have to do, Matthew, to your point, is you have to convince states that doing the right thing is in their self-interest. That is That this is about doing the right thing. It's not going to make a state richer to develop a treaty on crimes against humanity. It is going to allow them, if they incorporate crimes against humanity in their national law, to take a stand against impunity for these crimes. And it's going to make, it's going to make a statement that they're not going to be a safe haven for perpetrators of crimes against humanity, but it's not a treaty like a trade treaty that they hope to get richer because they've you know, developed this new global trade treaty. It's a treaty that's asking them to do the right thing for the right reasons for the long term. And it's a treaty that we put our focus on prevention of crimes against humanity, not just punishment, but actually developing global capacity through a monitoring mechanism, through lots of other techniques to help prevent these crimes so that you don't get a situation like Russia, Ukraine, so that you don't get widespread and massive sexual violence in the DRC. And I think that's where states have to see that that long term goal is really in their interest. And you have to pull them away a little bit from other really important domestic preoccupations, like dealing with COVID or dealing with, you know, economic crises. And so that's why I do think 
um, it's a more difficult time. We did also have a global recession in the middle of our treaty making exercise. And so, um, you know, saying, but spending money on preventing crimes against humanity is a great investment in the long term. And so I think, you know, and I would love your advice is how do you get states to realize, look, I'm in making this calculus between short-term gain and long-term gain, put some effort into these long-term regimes that are going to give you, you know, threefold your investment in the long term, but immediately not be as sellable to your domestic constituency or address an immediate pressing domestic problem. And so I think that's where we're we're working right now. Thank you so much for that. Uh, you posed a question for me, and I, I, I've got a million answers and none on, on how to persuade states, but I think if one comes immediately to mind for me, um, it's actually the notion, the metaphor of the train leaving the station, um, that as a state, or at least the represent a representative of a state, the sense that this treaty-making process is going ahead, whether we like it or not, and therefore, as a state, we need to engage with it, we need to show some support for it, because if you show support from it, you're more likely to get traction on its contents uh, than if you just say no, no, no. I think it is a critical moment for, for many, at least, treaty-making processes. Uh, and I'm fascinated by this, this, this question of, of how do you get put the train together and get it to leave the station, um, or at least give that sense that it's about to so that enough of the passengers, if you don't mind stretching the matter for too far, will get on board. Um, Susanna, may maybe we can turn to you on that, because, of course, the Landmines Treaty was, you know, e even for me, I confess I was uh, still at university or doing do my PhD at the time when, when the Landmines Treaty was adopted. But it, you know, it very much impinged on public consciousness and on state consciousness. I mean, could, could you say a few words about how you, how you yeah. achieved that? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I will say that when it came to the fast tracking of the treaty in 1996, which resulted in the 1997 treaty, um, there were government leaders, including Norway, Canada, Austria, and South Africa, who joined Belgium and others. And, and um, that was all. Um, but in terms of influencing governments, I think the first thing I'll say is that uh, interestingly, uh, Layla, you mentioned sort of the challenges today with the a possible this treaty on, on sexual violence. The thing about the issue of sexual violence is I don't think there's a single government that's going to stand up and say it's OK to commit rape and war. Right. But landmines, to the contrary, there were many governments that could easily stand up and argue that they need this weapon. There were the U.S. was arguing about the need for um, landmines on the, in the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. There were uh, a few governments, notably the U.S., arguing that they had smart minds and they were okay. They weren't indiscriminate and inhumane like the rest of the mines. So um, the campaign had its work cut out for it in terms of pushing the governments who going back, Matthew, to uh, Matt, to your question about um, you know the North and South, largely the developed wealthy northern countries were the producers and exporters of the, this weapon, and the places where they were being used and killing and maiming people were in the global South. And what happened was we were able to use that fact, if you will, or or present that very clear uh, fact to essentially shame the producers and exporters of this weapon and to mobilize the governments who had to manage the problem in Cambodia and Mozambique and Afghanistan and Colombia. And so early on, we, um, after the very first sort of initial meeting of the campaigners, which were a, essentially large Northern Western uh, NGOs, we brought in uh, people and organizations and the grassroots from mine affected countries. And one of the most um, powerful aspects of this coalition that became this huge campaign was its diversity, geographic diversity, um, bringing in faith-based organizations, the humanitarian community, the development community, the disarmament community, uh, international legal um, scholars and advocates, as well as eventually also military and ex-former -mil military leadership who were able to um, to basically take advantage of every single argument and create such a taboo around this very widely used and traded weapon 
that it became absolutely shameful and going back to sort of, are you in or are you out? Is this a fast moving train? You want to be on this train or do you want to be a spoiler? And the campaign used very, very effectively the media in calling out spoilers and in particular the United States um, for trying to water down the treaty or water down or not support a ban or initially call for a ban as Clinton did in 94 and then backtrack once the Pentagon sort of got its tentacles into the the treaty or the issue. Um, and uh, I, I think we were very effective in um, reaching governments where their interests were, going back to what you were saying, Layla, making it painful to support and export this weapon. And also, I mean, the mobilization of the populations in, in country, there were um, more than a thousand Cambodians who marched across the country that many of them on crutches, in little wagons, in makeshift wheelchairs. Uh, and that visible mobilization of humanity in Cambodia uh, caused King Sihanouk to support the ban, for example. Um, similarly in Mozambique, you know, and we, uh, as Leila mentioned, similarly to the effort for the Crimes Against Humanity Treaty, um, we, the campaign hosted its huge meetings and meetings were huge. There were sometimes a thousand people at the Lin-Mai's meetings from all sectors. And we had them in Maputo and Mozambique. We had them in Bangkok. We had them in Bogota. And that was really, really important to globalize uh, the effort and, and put the heat uh, in multiple languages before multiple governments and create what effectively did become indeed a fast moving train that eventually everybody wanted to be on. And of course, we did use celebrities or we were lucky to have celebrities, notably uh, Princess Di, who, who joined uh, towards the end as well and made very visible trips, for example, to, uh, to Bosnia and, and so forth. So um, I, I think we were very, very strategic and thoughtful and clever uh, in how we, we pressed um, and often embarrassed uh, governments. And I'll just say one fine. I mean, there were so many techniques we could go on and on, but uh, among them were, you know, putting these huge shoe piles in front of houses of parliament. Um, we created sort of fake landmines that people could walk across and imagine what it would be like to walk and walk and then suddenly have a, have something blow up. Um, you know, we created these little things like this is a, a little coaster pad says pick me up and on the back it says you stepped on a mine but we used to strew these little paper mines across conference halls and rooms and even where government delegates were we sneaked in we did some sort of guerrilla tactics i would say where we would sneak in before the government conference opened and, and put these things all around on the floor and people the delegates would look at what, what is this and it had the international campaign you know website on the back and the message that this this should not be allowed that you could step on this thing and it, it really brought home the the power of the issue uh, it will be interesting to think about you know where are the differences and similarities between uh among these different issues and how of course the call for a ban on this particular weapon is very straightforward and even though there were complexities it is much simpler than um, certainly than, than dealing with crimes against humanity, that huge issue. But I think it's also simpler and clearer than, um, than, than trying to deal with, with a treaty around sexual violence where um, the perpetration and intent is, is more complicated and governments are able to deny uh, responsibility or command control of uh, armies and so forth. Fascinating. Thank you. I, I, I'm really enjoying this and the different insights. I must say, Susanna, as you're talking there around, and so apologies for putting words in your mouth, uh, around the political economy of the issue that you were dealing with, it really struck me listening to uh, someone else who was talking to me a few months ago through the negotiation of the, uh, the Tobacco Control Convention in the World Health Organization. And again, their use of mobilization of the fact that you had the big companies, I'm not the tobacco producers, but the big companies were in the North, global North, and yet actually the vast majority of victims of tobacco are in the global South, and not just the victims, but the governments of the victims who are then responsible for the health systems 
and health systems that are being under pressure because of dealing with the effects of smoking. And the way that activists then use that political economy to create a dynamic within the negotiations and sort of saved this from being a sort of the global north preaching at the global south to, to, to introduce some far more complex dynamics that ended up with, a, with the convention. Um, but you've both alluded so far to uh, the parallels, possible parallels, but also contrasts um, with sexual violence in conflict. I wonder if I might press you for a couple more points each on where you see uh, those parallels or contrasts or the lessons you think that, that we need to draw in this instance. And Susanna, I'll turn to you in the first instance, if I may. Yeah, well, uh, in preparation for this, because you asked, uh, what lessons are there? And, and I'll, I'll just first say not necessarily the difference because I, I, I'm not sure I can imagine or, or understand deep down, you know, what, what, what the actual challenges will be today. And as Layla said, you know, the world literally is changing under our feet uh, every minute right now in terms of um, global politics and, and, and war. Um, but the, the first lesson that, that, that I, I, I um, and most of the campaigners um, brought, and I've mentioned this already, um, from the, the landmines campaign, the Van Landmines campaign, was to galvanize as broad a constituency and coalition as possible. And I've mentioned all the different elements of that, but it, it, it truly was powerful. Um, and the second is to keep the message simple. Um, and even if the issues are complex, and I, I will say that in spite of the fact that all we wanted to do was ban the production transfer use of this weapon, um, it, it, there were complications, obviously. Um, and it, even in, in definitional ones, are anti-tank mines part of this or not? That was a big controversial issue and so forth. Um, but we needed to, to, to have discipline and clear education of all the campaigners. So I would say the communication and messaging among the campaigners and those who were advocating for the for the ban and eventually for the treaty was absolutely key. And we're very fortunate. Somebody posted in the chat, you know, it looks like all men are negotiating these treaties. Well, you have Layla here and you have um, the, the not me, but the the coordinator of the campaign, Jody Williams, who shared in the Nobel Peace Prize in 97 with the campaigners with the campaign itself, Qua campaign is also, you know, the co this campaign was led a lot by women, I will say, even back in the 1990s. So I'm very proud of that part. Although certainly behind closed doors with the military guys, it was mostly guys, let's face it. Um, but the, 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 the data that we had about the problem, and as, as Leila has mentioned, also explaining clearly the need for the treaty. Where is the gap? Why is the convention on conventional weapons, not enough. Why does this weapon need to be absolutely banned, never used, et cetera? Um, that is really important. Um, also finding sort of some slogans that really click for people so that they could understand like, oh, anti-personnel landmines, what is that? You know, crime against humanity, what is that? Even sexual violence, although we have, at some point these words become just words. And so we, we constantly try to find language that would um, continue to, uh, to shock the conscience. Uh, landmines, we call them silent killers um, or hidden killers. Uh, we talk about the, the use of anti-personnel landmines as a global epidemic. Um, that might be harder to say these days. Um, and and then finding government champions and congratulating them publicly, really nurturing the government leadership and making them feel really great about what they were doing and enabling them to have the limelight. So the NGOs often sort of want to own the whole thing. And of course we did, but we understood that, you know, at some point South Africa needed to step forward and get all the limelight and Canada and Norway and so forth. Um, and then becoming, so expert that you had to be in the room. So that was absolutely critical. Literally honing the expertise and figuring out who are the key experts that had the answers that the negotiators needed. Um, another thing was the messaging around preventing 
the treaty from being watered down because everyone knows that at the end of the day in the final negotiations, governments will do everything possible or many governments uh, to, to sort of protect themselves and water it down. And so we had this really um, powerful uh, slogan that became the mantra of the campaign once, the tre once it was clear we were gonna have a treaty. And that was no exceptions, no reservations, no loopholes. And that was just simple. And we said that everywhere. We we wrote op-eds. We, you know, we had signs outside the, the the treaty negotiation meetings just saying that. So that you know, we also being there to that they would know that we would call them out um, if if they did <laughs> water down. And, and indeed, we did. Um, and then finally, I'll just say for any campaign, I would say this: um, constantly re-strategizing based on the political realities. Uh, I would say we were pragmatic idealist is what we came to be called as a campaign and I, I think that's that's mostly what it's about thank you so much Leila thank you and and again uh every one of those ideas Susanna is amazing and it I think listening to you talk about the kind of uh, advocacy that you could do around landmines, I think it will be trickier to do it with respect to sexual violence and armed conflict because it is a little harder. It, it, it's not a per se ban, although it is a prohibition, because I presume that you're going to be looking at some enforcement mechanisms, right? It's not enough to say this is unlawful. We know it's unlawful, actually. The problem I assume that you're identifying is that people aren't being punished for it or that they're not incentivized enough not to commit these, these, uh, these offenses. And so um, uh, what will be slightly trickier, I think in this case will be um, at least we've run a, a, against with crimes against humanity is there are a lot more ways to address state concerns by having mens rea requirements that are high, by having fights over modes of liability, for having fights over immunities, right? Um, because is it that the commander's been sloppy and not instructing their troops not to commit these crimes of sexual violence? Or is there actually an order given to do this? And that's pretty unusual, actually. Um, so I think the, the, the idea is as simple as the landmines idea. I think, Matthew, when I think about it, like no sexual violence and armed conflict. Yes, we're all, the, the idea is gonna be an easy idea to rally support for. The devil's gonna be obviously in the details. And we found the same thing. No state is gonna come out and say, I support the commission of crimes against humanity. No, states don't like crime, right? We're all against crimes against humanity. They're terrible. But then when you say, great, so, you know, why don't you lead this international campaign to make this treaty have some real teeth and have a monitoring mechanism and no immunities and, you know, culpability for uh, legal entities, if, if that is in your state law, all of a sudden, then that's where you feel pieces of resistance, like, oh, maybe that's a, a bridge too far, or maybe we should do that sort of on a um, case by case basis. So I think in terms of the lessons learned, um, you're already starting strong from the landmine sense in that you have a state that's excited about this that wants to lead the campaign. So that's a super, super um, development. We actually had to get states interested, which they are now. I posted a link. You can see that, that the train is leaving the station. It's just going really slowly. And there are all these logs on the track. And we're trying to remove the logs so that the train can actually leave the station. Um, so I think the fact that you have a state willing to spearhead this is great. Um, where I think it could run aground or the train would have more trouble is that there are other efforts ongoing. There is the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty. There's what's happening in Ukraine. We're still coming off a global pandemic. There's crimes against humanity. And so, uh, and there's the ICC, which needs much more support, especially as it undertakes new investigations. And so the landscape that this particular um, treaty is, is potential treaty is looking at is it's a slightly more complicated landscape and it has to insert itself into that landscape and pull along all the people working on these other things uh, to, to sort of create a 
a broad tent where all of these initiatives are seen as complementary to each other and uh, that the supporters of one support the other. And, and that I think is so, so these meetings even are fantastic where you pull in people that have worked on other initiatives like landmines or like I'm working on crimes against humanity just to make sure uh, that we all know about what each other are doing, that if there's a drafting exercise that's happening on the sexual violence treaty, that it is dovetailing nicely with the ICC, with the drafting exercise and the Crimes Against Humanity Treaty, et cetera. So I think that kind of coordination, I, I don't know that the kind of um, NGO strategy and, and building an NGO coalition, I think is actually important. I do think having civil society on board, one of the biggest organizations I work with is Parliamentarians for Global Action. They were very, very influential in Rome. David Donat Catan is still running, you know, I uh, running that and I'm still working with David and, and because they are lobbying legislatures who are gonna have to ratify these treaties, right? They're working directly with parliamentarians. So I think building that sort of broad tent um, is, is a great initiative. You're obviously starting to do that. You've got a state willing to take this forward. The risk for the UK, I think, as the spearheader is it will look like a global north versus a global south. And so a key thing I think would be to get partners from the global south willing to stand up and do this um, alongside of the United Kingdom. Um, I think that would be very, very important. Um, and the ICRC, because to the extent that you're envisaging perhaps another protocol, I don't know how with the form this will take. This is sort of getting into the lawyer's weeds, but is it a protocol to the Geneva Conventions? Uh, what is it going to be, actually? And who's going to be the guardian of this treaty? The ICRC is sort of the guardian of the treaties, right? The Geneva Conventions and the protocols. And so I would think they're a key interlocutor in the ultimate success of any new treaty on sexual violence in wartime, because it's also probably not going to be a per se offense uh, the way landmines. It's not, they're either legal or illegal. It's a ban. And that's just the, the conduct is going to be unlawful, but the actual implementation of the treaty is going to be much trickier for a sexual violence treaty than it is for the, for the landmines treaty. So I think I'll just stop there. Yeah. Can I just add another thing that I really haven't mentioned much at all about the landmines treaty? And I think it could be relevant on the sexual violence one, and at least from what I understand, the the impetus and um, and Dr. McQuaggy's a very strong um, uh, concerns that he's expressed often himself, and that is the humanitarian assistance component um, of the the landmines treaty was extremely unusual, and this is. I think in, almost entirely um, due to the NGO pressure, it has uh, uh, clauses in the treaty that um, I wouldn't say it's it's a hard obligation, but it directs states that are in a position to do so to assist with both demining and victim assistance. And um, it's un highly unusual. I think it's it's the only disarmament treaty that that calls for that. And thinking about the issues of sexual violence and where there may be gaps, that is another uh, big area to discuss and, it, and it's complicated, obviously. But um, again, the campaigners in the, in the Van Landmines campaign were really, really adamant that it, banning the weapon was not enough because there is so much harm um, that results uh, in the long run. So that's one element. And the second part is actually the verification and the monitoring, which will be another big challenge for a treaty on sexual violence, because that's that really is where the rub is. As Layla says, it's not as if uh, any government would say, oh, it's not a problem, it's not a crime, but rather they will say, well, we didn't do it, or we did everything we could to stop it, and we don't owe anything to these survivors. There are way too many um there's some other body for that and i think finally another challenge will be uh, unlike the landmines um effort where we were pretty much the only game in town if you will um with the issue of sexual violence there are so many multi-layered efforts as well as um we know the the core treaties as well as the rome statute that many people will think well 
it's already there. What else is needed? And I think explaining the gap and the need and why there's a need and what is missing is, is really the, the most critical issue to galvanize governments. Um, maybe we can talk a little more about the world climate, which I think is, as, as Leila also pointed out, so different in, in this decade than it was in the 1990s for any kind of um, international legal agreement. Um, yeah, and and I, sorry, Matthew, yes. let me just, just one other thing that Susanna said, which is so important, and we learned this through our negotiations, a victim-centered approach is really important. But and nowadays, the idea, it's not just about um, prosecution, it's about prevention. So there's capacity building that has to be done, and uh, reparations or other victim-centered measures are going to be critically important, because the old treaties just sort of ignored it. It's like, well, if you couldn't, right? So a reparation system, a victim-centered, and then assistance to states in capacity building and prevention. And that came out of our project, too, that it couldn't just be one of the old-fashioned control conventions or suppression conventions, that it had to have the more human rights uh, modern sort of dimension to it, which is a much more victim-centered approach and a much more uh, holistic approach to the problem. Absolutely. Uh, and introduce, but as you know, it introduces a whole further range of complexities. And I mean, you both alluded to the, the current international environment for treaty making and, and treaty making on, on these sort of broad area of, of issues. I suppose we could, we could say that, you know, in some ways that they're related, uh, crimes against humanity, landmines and, and conflict related sexual violence. Um, I mean, it, it, it's very tempting and to, to, to lay out a, an almost endless set of challenges now in the 2020s to, to treaty making uh, on these processes. Um, uh, and not least the fact that as both of you know, that um, more far more often by convention with a small C or by custom, treaty making is done by consensus um, in international fora, not by, a, uh, not by a simple majority vote. Um, but I'm wondering if you could highlight a, a, a couple of challenges that we've not faced, uh, that we've not discussed so far, but also any opportunities you see now um, for, for treaty making that maybe weren't as present um, 20 years ago more. Um, I wondered if you, uh, if you thought that, for example, global civil, civil society activism and net, networking was in some way sort of easier now in practical terms than it used to be, but maybe I'm just... Uh, uh, maybe I'm just uh, painting the past in the wrong light there. But if we could finish up then on this sort of, what you think about that treaty making environment writ large. Um, and we'll start with Leila and, and then move to Susanna if that's okay. So I think the treaty making environment is difficult right now. I really do. I mean, an, a great exception to that is the nuclear weapons treaty ban. So that the treaty uh, uh, for the banning of nuclear weapons is extremely successful in this particular environment. It's a bit like the landmines ban in that it focuses on a specific weapon. Uh, it has state support, but a lot of state opposition. Um, and it, it was very successful, even in this very difficult international environment. But I think right now the environment, my observation is that it is not impossible. Treaties are getting uh, formulated with these sort of outside inside partnerships where they're sort of alongside the United Nations system, but not starting inside the United States Nations system necessarily. They're sort of in relationship to the UN or to some other organization. Um, I think that the pandemic made it very difficult for global civil society because the pandemic really uh, stopped people from meeting in person. And a lot of these treaty negotiations, you know, when Susanna talks about we were able to go in and spread out little things across the floor. Well, if every meeting is virtual and civil society isn't there, uh, or one or two representatives are on the Zoom call, we've seen that it really diminishes the impact of what's happening. So I think um, the pandemic has really made the international environment much more difficult. I think there are some opportunities. I think there's heightened um, energy into international justice, peace and security now because of the conflict in Ukraine, uh, which is highlighting that we thought rightly or wrongly, right? We thought, oh, those days are over. And in fact, 
they're not over at all. It is true that a treaty on prevention uh, of sexual violence and armed conflict is going to be a global South. But I mean, think about where this is happening. It's true that the Bosnian war was rife with sexual violence. Um, there's concern about this in the Russia-Ukraine situation, and the prosecutor has said he's looking at it. We don't see it happening yet, um, but we know that it's in the ICC cases of Central African Republic, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, DRC, Uganda. I mean, everywhere we're seeing a huge amount of sexual violence um, uh, in, in, in the global south. So, I, and both the desire to combat it and the irritation that this looks like another North-South exercise. So I think, uh, I guess what I'd say, Matthew, I don't think it's worse than it's been. I, I just don't, I don't think it's great. I don't think we're in the 1990s where we're excited about constructing all these regimes. I think we're in a much more tired um, uh, difficult environment, but that said, we are seeing some progress being made, and and I think that um, there that it's worth persisting. <laughs> so I guess that's where I would come down on it. Lots of lots of difficulties, but that doesn't mean it's not worth the the uh, worth a shot, basically. Thank you so much, Susanna. And any remarks from you on that score? So well, I largely agree with with Layla on this. Um, I will say that again that the, the the ground is shifting so rapidly right now in terms of the international consensus because of russia's invasion of ukraine uh, and so there may be a constituency of states that is very keen to um, restrict what can be done in armed conflict as a result of the mobilization on every continent that being said we have a much more polarized climate and a much more hostile climate, especially at the UN Security Council, um, where we can expect that at least uh, two of the five permanent members would likely uh, not support anything that deals with crimes against humanity and so forth, as we've seen with the case of the effort to refer Syria uh, to the ICC. And the fact that the Syria war is one where sexual violence was indeed has yeah. been um, fairly extensive and Russia is implicated in that conflict, there will be some uh, some challenges around that at the same time that I think there there's an interesting ground. Um, I will going back to your comment about the or the, these treaties have to have to move forward by consensus. The interest another interesting aspect about the mine ban treaty, is that it didn't operate by consensus. It operated by vote for the treaty and it was an opt-in. So you opt in to support this ban or you don't come to the party. And you know, maybe it's this is this is a model that might work better in this instance where one can rely, um, I think, on many, many dozens of, of nations as you already have perhaps um, interested in this um to support um, something that might be outside the the traditional un system i will say also though that the secretary general butros butros gali supported the ban he was at the um that kofi annan was was at the at the signing and so you know the the, sec the role of the un is important at the same time i think the respect for the un's ability to um, enact its charter including in, in the case of war crimes is very low right now. And so um, I think there could be a lot of skepticism and maybe even approaching despair around um, a new treaty like this that deals with this, this kind of issue. And I don't mean, mean to be negative at all, just realistic. Um, so I think there's, there's sort of interesting opportunities, but also immense um, challenges. And finally, in fact, if it turns out, and I hope it does turn out, um, I mean, the horrible as this war is, that sexual violence does not seem to be a big factor at the moment. I hope it won't be. Um, the, the, the situation, the sense of urgency of this issue in this conflict may not be for, at the forefront. And so the challenge will also be to point to the countries and situations like Myanmar, for example, 
where sexual violence is used, Sudan continuing horrible uh, situation of, of rape and Darfur that's, that's ongoing and so forth. And so um, that, that will be a need in terms of driving a treaty and, and basically the momentum that's needed for a treaty. Can I add one finger to that, Matt, which is one thing that the UK might consider doing is rather than go for the global treaty is to convince a group of states to do it on a regional level first. You know, enforced disappearances started in Latin America with a treaty effort. So, um, you know, take a group of states implicated, get those heads of states to say, we need to stop sexual violence in our region. Uh, where it's an ongoing critical problem, and then build from the ground up, build from the regions um, to the global rather than from the global to the regions. And that's something that we have seen. We've seen, especially in the Americas, we've seen um, you know, important treaties there that then get globalized. You could imagine Af asking the African Union to take this up, asking, right? So maybe work on it that way, work uh, in the in the periphery building support in regions um, outside and then kind of move it up to the international level. It, it might have, and, and there would be some different interesting regional aspects to it that way as well. And it wouldn't just seem like a top-down WIOG effort again. Uh, it's just a thought, but it's something that you do see in other areas where there have been particular crimes or particular phenomenon that have plagued a specific region. Um, and getting the heads of state in those region or their ministries of foreign affairs to say, this is a critical problem for our region and our countries, and we're going to group together to do that and assist in that effort and then take it, sort of move it to the global level after that. Just a thought. Interesting. And, you, and you've seen that done in different ways as well. That, that I, mean, I mean, the one thing I, I, maybe I'm wrong on this, but I always say is it's very rare to get a regional treaty that itself becomes globalized, but regional actors can create their own regional treaty and then try to create a separate global treaty on the back of it, using the regional treaty as the inspiration for it. Um, I mean, very rarely are you going to get European states simply signing up to an African treaty or vice versa. But nonetheless, that coalition building amongst regional actors whether it's we see it in the environmental field, whether we see it on um, uh, in the human rights field, um, is as you say um, a really interesting way of doing it. I mean, thank you so much to both of you. It's been an incredibly rich discussion. Um, I'm not even going to attempt to sum it up, but uh, three things sort of just draw it together a little, at least from your final remarks. I thought. Uh, uh, particularly striking and in no particular order. Um, one is this really interesting question of the, of the monitoring mechanism, monitoring and enforcement mechanisms. As you say, I think, Leila, you know, no one doubts that sexual violence is prohibited. The question is, what are we going to do about it? And I think there's a big unanswered question on states' attitude towards monitoring mechanisms now writ large. Um, we've seen a lot of use of monitoring mechanisms in this field in the last five years, approximately. We've seen it in spades over Ukraine in the last few weeks. And it will be really interesting to see how states react now to proposals to have such monitoring mechanisms, whether they're expert committees, whether they're um, uh, reparations mechanisms, whether they're uh, ICJ referral mechanisms um, be really, really interesting. I think we can imagine where certain permanent members of the Security Council are going to come out on that. But I think there's a really open question about where most of the world will position itself towards those. The second is, I think, drawing on Susanna's point around political moments. Um, I mean, you know, as I say, I, I was an undergraduate when the ICTY was created in 93. But you know, did we imagine two years before? I don't think the British government did. Um, and yet it became possible. Uh, and political moments mean so much in, 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 these, uh, in these long running campaigns. Um, in the same way that I don't, think, I don't think we expected Canada to stand up and run with the Landmines Convention. Um, so the political moments question. And then the third one is around this importance of influential 
international actors who are not states or who may be states, but with moral authority, um, whether it is the ICRC as an organization or a UN secretary general, but not just the secretary general for being secretary general, but an individual who is perceived to hold moral authority um, of an issue can really swing both uh, attitudes within states, but also between states and the importance of their forum, uh, uh, their support for, for a project like this. But uh, enough from me. Thank you so much from both of you. Uh, it's been a fascinating session and I'll hand back to Erin. Thank you so much, Dr. Preston, for so skillfully moderating this absolutely fascinating discussion. And I want to really thank our distinguished panelists, Professor Leila Sadat and Susanna Serkin, for sharing your experiences and expertise on this topic of uh, your experience with the treaty making process. The insights you've provided us with have definitely given us at the McQuiggy Foundation, I'm sure the audience listening as well, so much to reflect upon. I would like to again thank the panelists and moderators from our earlier sessions, and of course to the United Kingdom FCDO for sponsoring the entirety of this expert conference. To our audience, Thank you for joining us. And we hope that you have found this expert conference as thought provoking and as for, and informative as we at the McQuaggy Foundation have. In closing, reflecting on the impetus of the Red Line Initiative itself, namely the call from our founder, Dr. Dennis McQuaggy, that sexual violence and conflict represents a violation of our shared humanity that can no longer be accepted. We look forward to continuing to discuss, to learn, and to exchange with all of you as we join together in what I know is a shared commitment to address in a real concrete manner the continuing scourge, scourge of sexual violence and conflict and its use as a method of warfare. With that, I will close the McQuaggy Foundation's expert conference on the treaty making process. Once again, thank you to all of our panelists and all of our moderators. Have a lovely day. Thank you so much. <laughs>